I've come to the conclusion that we have almost no idea what we are. That what I've learned to do now in grandfatherhood is to be able to live comfortably with uncertainty. We don't know the boundaries of what we are. We barely understand how we really function. You can sit down and draw an, an anatom anatomical you know, figure and you can look at all of this you know, as organs and as all of this, you can go out of the molecular level, you can look at all those kinds of things and see how it works. But we don't really understand how or why it works. And I, you know, I, th I think I've been fascinated by the James Webb telescope and the photographs that have come back, because we don't even know where we are. We don't even know what we're in. You know, the scientists say, you know, well, there's the Big Bang Theory, and we're expanding, and, you know, we have light, and there's red light and orange light, and there's different speeds, and blah, 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 and we know the universe is expanding. And my now eight-year-old son said, yeah, but Dad, what was going on before the Big Bang, and what are we going into? Wonderful. So you're kind of going, we don't know anything. And I think, I think it's important to stay very aware of it. We don't really know what makes us tick. So we better be very careful about judging other people. Welcome to another installment of Behind Greatness by Inspire. It's Luciano here as usual as your host. And before we get into it, I uh, want to remind the listener, uh, if you haven't uh, already rated, um, please do so. Share with your family and friends. Uh, and if you're if you're inclined to give to the causes, we're uh, a not for profit and also a charity. Uh, just go to our website. You'll you'll find where you need to go uh, behind greatness dot org. Uh, we're excited this week. We have yet another special guest um, and a special thank you. Before I forget to uh, Thomas Verney, Dr. Thomas Verney, who is uh, uh, who is a guest on our podcast. A few weeks back, uh, he made the introduction uh, to Stephen, and Stephen was uh, um, very gracious in accepting the invite. So here we go. Stephen Gyllenhaal is founder and director of the Identity Development Institute in LA, in association with the Institute for Trauma Work Norway and Dr. Franz Rupert in Munich University in Germany. As an award-winning Hollywood director, Stephen tackled difficult and relevant psychological themes uh, through his movies, TV shows, and documentaries, including Twin Peaks, Rectify, Dangerous Woman, Losing Isaiah, Paris Trout, Girl Fight, Waterland, Killing in a Small Town, Leap of Faith, Shattered Mind, and In Utero. He is now in post-production on two documentaries, The Bond and Uncharitable, as well as writing two books, a professional patient and a liquid motel. He has also published, and this is what I learned from Thomas, uh, he's also published a book of poetry uh, named Claptrap, Notes from Hollywood. Stephen's powerful contributions through film, literature, and now through the Identity Development Institute are paradigm-shifting opportunities to recalibrate our vision and experience of human beingness toward a towards a birthright of thriving in a world of traumatizing structures and events. Well, welcome to the program, Stephen. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and so I, I want to, and I should have said it, but uh, I want to direct the, um, uh, the listener to uh, Identity Develop Institute. Is that right? Develop in, right. Identity Identity Develop. Develop Institute com. Right. Yeah. So I, I, let's get right into it. What is uh, the Identity Development Institute? Well, um, how would I start framing that? Um, why would I have gone to Hollywood and become a director and gone through what you really go through when you go to Hollywood and become a director, which is, to be honest, you have to be a little bit crazy. And, and I was a little bit more than a little bit crazy. I really struggled with... Um, a lot of psychological issues growing up as, as and growing up and and as I became an adult and I did um, a tremendous amount of therapy um, analysis 12-step programs all those things um, my parents were uh, alcoholics and my mother had an issue with drugs as well and I had five younger brothers and sisters you go on and on and on about what could cause um, someone to wonder if they were nuts <laughs> 
And also, you know, a lot of crazy people go to Hollywood and do very, very well. And in fact, um, I think it takes, as I said, some some level of obsessiveness and and a need to fill something inside, which you could call narcissism. I'd say I struggle with that. I I want to examine the def, sort of the the pathologizing of of the term narcissism somewhere down the line. But I think um, <clears throat> I was in therapies from the time I was in college, which was 1972. I'm 73 years old. Um, and through now, and in the process, really tried to figure out what was wrong with me. Now, one of the, the privileges of being a white guy in America, um, which a lot of people, ha and also making decent money, good money in Hollywood, was that I could explore all these, these methodologies. And I'm very aware that I'm very privileged, and it's important to stay attentive to that, which makes me sort of responsible for taking what I've learned and doing something with it. Not because I'm particularly um, thoughtful of other people, but because doing anything else, if you're just involved with yourself, can destroy you, I think. And I think I, I found that. So uh, along the line, I explored a lot of different approaches. I then made a documentary, we, we mentioned it called In Utero, mm -hmm. uh, because I was, um, I, had a family that I that I raised, Maggie and Jake, are, are the result, and I'm very very proud of them, and I think they're really important contributors to the world. And then I um, married again a second time. We wanted to have a child. Um, I loved raising children. To me, being a father is is the most important thing I've done, and a grandfather now by far, by far, by far. There's nothing. There's there's really no second place. Not even running an institute. Being a parent is to me the greatest privilege I've had, actually. Um, and anyway, so I wanted to um, have a child. We had some problems with it and being again privileged, um, I was able to say, well, let's make a documentary about pregnancy. So that's what we did. And we reached out to sort of the top people um, in the world and interviewed them. And one of them was Thomas Verney, one of them was Gabor Mate. Um, there, there were, those are the two sort of, uh, you Thomas has been on your show. Kapoor Mate is quite well known, just did this documentary, The Wisdom of Trauma, the brilliant, brilliant minds who helped us with the science of pregnancy. And I am very much a proponent of science. I'm not perfect science. One of the problems with science is that you get the good issues and you get the more problematic issues and you have to outweigh what are you going to do between the two of them because we're still trying to uncover the truth. Um, and And so... In making that documentary and finishing it and really getting the science down around pregnancy, we were in Paris at one point um, and we were um, on a slight uh, vacation and we got a call from someone in Amsterdam who said, your documentary has captured what our therapy has done, which is trauma, and trauma is sort of the byword in psychology right now, starts in utero, starts at the various, various earliest stages of life. You know, there's a lot of work around trauma, you know, ACEs, um, adverse childhood experiences, all these other areas now are talking about trauma, which we can capture once people are verbal, really from three to four years old until the present. Trauma has become very, very clearly a critical explanation for what's wrong with you. And it was clear, it wasn't even clear to me at that point that trauma was at the core of what my issues were. But as I made the film and then discovered this methodology, it became crystal clear to me that trauma, in fact, early trauma, trauma from, from conception on pregnancy, birth, uh, their early years, um, are where the answers sit for where we are challenged. And once I discovered this methodology, oh, and I had gone back to college, I'd gone back to school because I'd want to become a therapist. I decided filmmaking was for my children, for young people, mm -hmm. and I would actually have a great life and grow old pleasantly becoming a therapist. So I'd gone back to school to get an MFT degree. And then in the process of making this movie, I discovered this methodology and discovered really kind of the core issues that were that had disturbed me from the earliest parts of my life. And I shifted into training in that methodology and then bringing it to the United States. And the result is the Identity Development Institute. I hope that explains it more or less. 
Uh, yeah, well, thank you for the background. Um, uh, you gave a pretty comprehensive one, uh, and maybe we can we can wedge in on some of those uh, some of those parts uh, uh, of the background. Uh, and that's a method. So just to finish off on on the second question, that methodology was originally developed by um, a, a German scientist. Uh, we mentioned his name, Franz Rupert. Yeah, Franz Rupert, yeah. And it, he had been working. Some people may know about family constellations. He'd been working with Bert Hellinger um, around family constellations, and then moved it more and more towards science. And Bert Hellinger had done that somewhat as well. He had discovered the beginnings of the methodology working with um, the indigenous peoples in South Africa and had discovered that, um, that people can sense in profoundly detailed ways what is traumatizing other people. And because these were people that were very close together living in tribes, they were able to pick up details and recognize those details very clearly as being the answers to cleaning up problems that people in the tribe were having. So that slowly got evolved by Bert Hellinger, first of all, and then further by Franz Rupert, as more and more neurobiology, neuroscience, um, clinical work was being done in the 80s and 90s, and the work really crystallized in the late 90s and the beginning of the 2000s. You know, uh, Bessel van der Kock's work um, really also helped define some of this. I mean, a lot of scientists around this began to... to um, to, to see it. And there's, you know, there's a lot around trauma right now. We're about early trauma because this work can get back to what happened at the very earliest stages of life, um, which is, which you can only really understand by doing the work. So I invite anyone to come and do a session there by donation. You can just look up my name or look up um, Identity Development Institute. It's easy to remember my name. Just look got Maggie and Jake, and you get the spelling, and then you can find me. Right. So I joke around how I, I gained six months of my life when my kids became famous because they could, they could both pronounce and spell my name. I didn't have to spell it over and over again. So, so yeah, I think it's, um, um, so th that's the best way to do it. We can play around with this maybe a little bit later in the session if you want about how yeah, it works. Yeah, for sure. For sure. But, um, but it's very, very powerful and it changed my life. So that's, that's what it is. And I love it. Uh, you were, uh, you were on a session uh, with um, Thomas Verney as well on his podcast. So I, you know, I obviously I listened to, um, listened to that episode and we talked about it. Um, in doing so, I, I learned uh, a little bit about you uh, that I didn't learn while you and I spoke afterwards. Um, and you said something very simple. Um, so, uh, but it, it isn't, uh, and you said that you became, you became a director because you're interested in, in, uh, in what makes people tick. What makes people tick? Well, that's a good question. I've come to the conclusion that we have almost no idea what we are. That what I've learned to do now in grandfatherhood is to be able to live comfortably with uncertainty. We don't know the boundaries of what we are. We barely understand how we really function. You can sit down and draw an, an anatom anatomical you know, figure and you can look at all of this you know, as organs and as all of this, you can go out the molecular level, you can look at all those kinds of things and see how it works. But we don't really understand how or why it works. And I, you know, I, th I think I've been fascinated by the James Webb telescope and the photographs that have come back because we don't even know where we are. We don't even know what we're in. You know, the scientists say, you know, well, there's the Big Bang Theory and we're expanding and, you know, we have light and there's red light and orange light and there's different speeds and blah, blah, blah. And we know the universe is expanding. And my now eight-year-old son said, yeah, but dad, what was going on before the Big Bang? And what are we going into? Wonderful. So you're kind of going, we don't know anything. And I think, I think it's important to stay very aware of it. We don't really know what makes us tick. So we better be very careful about judging other people. We better be very careful even about what we do. Um, the best we can do, I think, really, is the intellect, yes, the scientific mind you know, the being skeptical and the heart. 
And together, moving forward with great care, I think we can we can begin to get a sense of what makes us tick. I think I think what I've learned is from trauma. There's so much to talk about again about trauma. I'm increasingly interested in the word bonding hmm. because trauma is caused by the lack of connection, the lack of bond. I, I, I never thought of it this way, but you you did say when a trauma begins, quote unquote, you split and your organs and your body absorb this split. Yeah, that's which right. Which would be the opposite of bonding, I guess. Yeah, very much the opposite of bonding because what happens is the wound, the profound wound. So in many, many cases, parents with the best of intentions, they don't know what this little organism is. And they weren't treated well either. They weren't treated sure. well, not because they didn't have parents who didn't love them or try to love them or do whatever, but just, you know, I think the best parents I know, the people who know the most about parenting are people who haven't done it. <laughs> it's the same thing with movie making. Uh, the best directors I yes. know, the most brilliant directors I know are people who've never directed a movie. You know, back to your quote, uh, when you live in uncertainty, you you can't judge anybody else. But yeah. we should all admit that that is what we are living in. Like, yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> and, and then we're we okay. And then we're okay. Then, you know, yes. you know, and I've learned it's taken me a long time because, you know, everyone's intimidated by this and by that. I mean, try going into a studio in Hollywood where you walk into an office and there's a guy who's literally has his desk or a woman built slightly above where you're sitting. They literally have... Some of them have platforms that are slightly higher, so they're looking down at you. Be a 25-year-old kid going to MGM, knowing you know nothing real about movies and you're trying to get a job. You're terrified. Sure. You're terrified. Sure. And you fake it. But then there's a point when you go, I don't know. The, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. And I've learned over the years, you surround yourself with people who know little bits and pieces much better than you. That's sort of what a director is. But I think, I think in terms of these issues of what make us tick, my experience is, from all these sessions that I do, is that it's really about connection and bonding. And what is that about? It is about love. That, that word that is so dangerous in a way, in so many ways, you know, having, having had a couple of marriages and lots of kids and all the issues that go around that, you know, you know, one of the things that you can fall back on is the chemistry of love. I mean, what are the, the cortisol and the you know, adrenaline and all those kinds of things? You can fall back on that for a little while. But ultimately, you know, we know what love is. We know when we love somebody, maybe even for the wrong reasons. Well, we feel. We, know when our, we feel. That's how we know. And we feel. We, we ache in some way. We, we have it's, it's our whole system aches in a way, whether it's children, whether it's a lover, whether it's a sibling, whether it's a parent. I mean, it's very clear that babies love their mother no matter what, no matter what. They ache for their mothers. Um, I sent a text this morning. I have a group chat with my kids and my wife. Uh, not to get too personal, but you've inspired me to get, to get personal. Uh, I was just in the middle of my work, just grunting away this morning. Um, and I just sent them out. I'm going to send a message. And I just put, I love you guys in the group chat, just, just because I wasn't looking for a response. I just, I want, I want to let them know that I do. Um, and I think maybe, so now that we're talking about this and now that I'm I actually, I'm listening to, I'm listening to more of this, maybe it's because, um, as and I'm not complaining here, I'm not being, a, but maybe it's because when I was young, I didn't hear it enough. Maybe, oh, yeah. maybe that's why I do it. Yeah. Yeah. I think, and I think, well, an interesting thing, about love and it's and the need for it and the lack of it. In my life, many, many problems. You know, my, my father had PTSD from World War II. He freed some of the concentration camps. His father committed suicide when he was 12 years old. I mean, you can go on and on about, you know, the family skeletons in the closet, in the closet <laughs> that I have. Pretty big. I have on the other side, alcoholics, you know, a big, big, big mess. And so I, and I've done a tremendous amount of work on myself, which really when you're working on yourself isn't long before you're working on your parents and your grandparents and your sure. great parents. Sure. Going back, back, back. I had three grandparents, my two grandfathers and one of my grandmothers. 
who were an utter mess, just a complete mess. Suicide, horrible other grandfather, bully, everything else. Grandmother who was profound alcoholic and miserable, miserable. So how did I, how did I function? What, what happened? Here's what happened. I discovered my other grandmother, the wife of the one who committed suicide, who I knew a little bit, who wasn't perfect, who was a little bit uptight, but who was spectacular. She grew up in a religious town, very conservative, very right wing. And she was a feminist in the 1920s. Wow. She was a writer. She was very, very into, um, you know, sort of political issues. She mm. protected some people who were being attacked by the community, a woman in particular. And it was only recently that I realized all it took was one person struggling with six kids after her husband hung himself, who got them all through college, who got three of her sons through World War II. And somehow that epigenetically, transgenerationally shifted and found its way through to me, utterly forgotten until I ran into a manuscript, got all the details on her, started reaching out to relatives and discovered it was one woman who, who changed everything for me and for my siblings and for my children and for my grandchildren. That's all it takes. And all she did was think for herself, cook great cinnamon buns, I remember that, and, and loved, and loved, and was also in grief. I remember her walking along the beaches by herself, seeing her in the distance in the fog, walking away by herself. But I could feel that she saw me in that way, just saw me, just was there. And that's all it took. That's a great breakthrough. Um, you. You had mentioned to me as well that um, you were, I mean, not, not, to, not to go so much into the past unless you want to share again, but uh, I, I guess I'm going to try and bring this to a point. You, uh, you, you grew up in a cultish type of environment uh, in Pennsylvania, um, and you were kind of the weird kid for a while in school when outside of this community, uh, but you were, uh, you were good in sports and you were able to get into a, a really good high school and so on and so forth. And then uh, in college, you were exploring like everybody else does, right? Uh, but you said you, you said you did a <laughs> you did a lot of crazy shit in your life, uh, and at points you were utterly irresponsible. But it seemed like, in listening to your story from the outside, and then again when when we spoke last time, there was it seemed like there was a rudder there uh, that you just needed to find. So I didn't know this about your grandmother. This seems to be like a, a one of those large rudders that you that you found and and to have you navigate. Um, it, maybe it wasn't a mistake, uh, a mistake, uh, that's not the word. It wasn't a coincidence, which is also a word I don't like, uh, that you, that you latched onto a grand curiosity that you found uh, in college. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I, I don't know what I can, I could go into detail about what I think is the engine in me. Hmm. Much of it, I think on the surface looks like anxiety. You dig a little deeper in therapy or whatever, it looks like fear. You keep digging down deeper and deeper into the deeper and deeper layers and get younger and younger to terror, pure terror, an existential terror of, am I gonna survive at six months old, at a year old or whatever? And that engine of terror, that engine is very powerful. And I think it was informed, I think it was informed by my grandmother because my father had it. When, when he was in Germany after the war, he occupied Germany after the war for a year. He had been a tank commander with Patton's 4th Armored Division. And I've been thinking a lot about my father recently. Um, he had opened some of the concentration camps, the horror of those camps. And he then, and he, became, he wanted to be a journalist and he had to kind of give it up um, because he suddenly had a bunch of kids. But he wanted to be a journalist. And he said he spent the year while he was occupying Germany, asking people, did they know about the concentration camps? And they all said, no, no, we didn't know. No, no, we didn't know. And then one of them said, no way, no, you know, well, I did give chocolate to them. I was, I gave chocolate to them between the body, between the red. You know, well, wait a minute. You knew about it. You gave them chocolate, but you don't know about it. So, you know, the level of denial was huge, but the need to try and understand 
what he had experienced. He became profoundly anti-war in a town where we went back to and lived in the cult that was utterly right wing. I mean, very much Trump land now. He was never that. Part of the reason why he became an alcoholic, I think. But he was searching. He was searching his whole life. And I think that came from my grandmother. And then and then because he did not commit suicide, he didn't live for very long. He, did, he died young, but he did not commit suicide, which was, I think, on his mind a lot, particularly after the war. He was very anti-war. He loved Kurt Vonnegut, for instance. He loved all the anti-war writers. He was very literate. My mother was quite literate, too. But she was a woman caught in the woman's journey that we've luckily broken out of, hopefully, you know, to a great degree. But but that curiosity, that that demand to know definitely was not something I chose. It was something that I absorbed from my father. And because he was kind of a crazy guy, I was pretty crazy too. Well, let's 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 define crazy in the in the lens of searching, because you said your grandmother was a searcher, your dad is a searcher. Um in, in just by mere fact that you chose a vocation, or at least your first vocation uh, in movie directing, tells and especially in documentaries, tells me that you are a searcher. It, it, searchers, I guess, by that general definition, would have to be a little nuts. But shouldn't we all be that little nuts? Well, I think you know Artie Lang, wonderful um, scientist and therapist, who was very into schizophrenia in the '60s. Um, it's 50, mainly the 60s, um, really worth exploring if people don't know about R.D. Lang, said post-World War II, where millions of people were slaughtered and the, and the concentration camps and all the people killed in Russia and just in, in, in China and everywhere else, he said, if you are sane in an insane world, then you're insane. I just read a, a book with my son uh, for the first time in 30 years. He's written it. He's re uh, read it for the first time. Famous Last Words, Timothy Finley. Uh, and about this theme yeah, during, yeah. during World War II in Europe. So, so and it's sort of Catch-22 captures that perfectly. So if you are insane in an insane world, and the fact that we are now again talking about using nuclear weapons... Who had been talking about it and taking it seriously means we are in an insane world. From my point of view, what has happened around Rover, I mean, if you can get into politics, right and left, there's a lot of insanity. I mean, I follow news. For me, the news, because my father loved the news, is my pornography. I can't get enough of it, you know, and I have to, every day I turn to it, it's just because what's going on in the present, and I love history, I've always loved history, is so fascinating. Um, but it's insane. I mean, the fact that our histories are usually defined by wars proves it's insane, as yes. opposed to the discoveries that have happened. The wheel was discovered. I mean, that's where human history really is. And human history is moving forward. I mean, you can talk about all the regressive stuff that's gone on around women's rights in the last little while and how bad it is in many parts of the world. It's way better than it was 50 years ago, everywhere. Mm -hmm. And everywhere. It, for me, Having you know two kick-ass granddaughters and a and a spectacular daughter who's doing some of the most interesting feminist work in movies now, mm -hmm. um, I am uh, 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 oh not a warrior exactly that's the wrong word, um, but 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 for for women's rights I mean because men can't be men unless women can be women fully, too. Oh, uh, well said, well said. Um... Ah, that's interesting too. That's interesting too. Because uh, I, I'm I'm tired of saying uh, he's a strong man, she's a strong woman. Because uh, it doesn't it doesn't matter. They're human beings, and they have love, and they're a searcher, and there's a light in them. Then it, I don't care what their gender is. We're still stuck on it, but I, we're stuck on it obviously for the reasons that uh, that you've just discussed. But that is interesting. Uh, what? So speaking of your kids, what? What did they absorb in your household growing up? What is it that they saw with their dad? I'm still trying to figure that out exactly. I think it's a combination of my ex-wife and I are very, very, very different. And people have said, you know, one of the advantages of being having two parents is, you know, and I don't want to in any way 
say it's better than anything else, but mm -hmm. you get two different points of view. And so I think that was a piece of it. I think um, both Naomi and I um, are very creative. So they grew up around all of this. They grew up, and you know, also they, they have, they lived in a bubble. They got the best education possible, which shouldn't be a bubble. Everyone should get it. In fact, part of our problem is, is that the best resources in the world aren't being used. You know, the kids in the ghetto who may be the ones who ultimately discover how to deal with the ozone layers. I mean, these, these yeah. brilliant, brilliant kids who are not getting what my kids got. So they got that. And that was definitely from their mom, who was really into education more than I was and really very responsible about all of that. I think also they got the ability to say, we don't agree with you, mom and dad. We're going to get our own help. We're going to figure out our own stuff. You screwed up. And I was very open to say, look, I did a lot of things wrong. And that, again, we're talking uncertainty. We're talking, you know, I don't have a clear answer. Um, I, think, I think I want to go back to one thing earlier, which was this issue of craziness. Because I think I also don't want to, I don't want to pathologize anything. But I also don't ro want to romanticize craziness. I don't, I was in pain a lot of my life. And I did feel I was crazy. And actually, when I was in high school, I was the perfect boy, which is very typical of what children of alcoholics are. I was totally pretending to be someone I wasn't. And that was driving me crazy as well. And I basically thought, I'm crazy. I did crazy things. I would hitchhike. I'd almost get killed. A lot of things different. A lot of things happened. And try hitchhiking. People may not know this in Canada, if, wherever, but... Try hitchhiking from right before you get to New York City until you get into Connecticut, going over the George Washington Bridge, where there's a section of road that goes through Harlem, and Harlem is 75 feet above you in concrete, and there's this much sidewalk space, and you're hitchhiking. And the fact that I was doing that was crazy, and I would never let my children do that. It's crazy. I could have gotten killed a ton of times, and that, that would have been crazy to be dead. So I think think those levels of things are need to be examined carefully. Um, but I was pretty sure I was crazy. I hadn't hardly seen any movies. I was lost and frightened and terrified of college. And then one day I walked into the local, not the local theater, but there was the theater on campus that showed old, old movies, Fellini, well, not old, but Fellini, satiric, Fellini, Bergman, um, you know, Coppola, all those. And I went, I'm not crazy. These people are speaking in a language that makes me understand who I am. And that's why I love cinema. And that's why I love movies. And that's why art is so critical in all this, because it speaks to and deconstructs that simple term of being crazy or sane. You know, it's like, actually, Jake has a saying that I think, I don't know where it came from, that I love, maybe it came from me, but I'm not sure. Art is there to comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable. Disturb the comfortable. Yeah. Who are in terrible trouble. The people who are comfortable are in terrible trouble because they're, they're imagining they can cover up the pain that they feel by being yeah. comfortable, by having a great house, by having the right car, you know, and, and then they jump off a building at some point. I mean, I know people who've done this. They're going, why did you hide this inside for so long? We're all human. We're all messed up. But we're... And that's what, something my father also was able to speak to. You know, he said, "I'm struggling." I, I, I not to go back to that uh, again, but it, it that is something. So I had grandparents who fought in that war too. They didn't want to, and they were 18, 19 years old. No, I know. harrowing stories that I that I heard when I was that age about um, their youth, and their youth was completely taken from them, obviously for for those reasons. Yep, 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 yep. Uh, but that's a that's a generation. Um, that didn't want to bring that same trauma to their kids, but uh, there were no tools. There were no tools there that, to learn to help not transfer that to their kids. I, actually, that reminds me that uh, we had, and you might be interested in this too, um, a Ukrainian refugee was on the podcast. Uh, and one of our other podcast guests, uh, from American living in France, a wonderful lady, Joan Quenig, uh, brought her into France or helped bring her into France and introduced me to her. And she was a psychologist, um, very uh, delightful woman. Uh, I didn't know that she was also, she had a psychic abilities. 
And so during the podcast, uh, she told me about, and we had to cut it out because it got really personal, but so I won't touch on it too much, but she, she let me know that uh, there are two generations in my family that were carrying a trauma and she identified who they were and she wasn't wrong. I didn't, I didn't share anything of my life with her. She wasn't wrong. And she said to me, this is curious because then you, you, uh, let me circle back on uh, very quickly to epigenetics because you talked yeah. about epigenetics. So Bruce Lipton, we've had on a podcast, obviously Thomas Verney, who you respect very much. Um, she said to me, you, thankfully, you did not bring on their programs. You know, I, I, that astounded me when she said that. It made me a little emotional um, because I didn't ask for it and I didn't share anything. And she told me this and it brought back all of my youth. Uh, and it was a wonderful, it was like, um, it was like an unveiling, like a permission to unveil things. Uh, I felt it was very, very beautiful. But I was open to it. <laughs> yeah, I think I think you know. I want to step into that for a minute. The whole yeah. idea of psychic, um, and what my work is, which people have when they experienced it, sometimes consider it psychic because it can go to the same places very quickly. I mean, you saw when I did it with Thomas Verney, who suddenly went, "I, I don't want to go." You know, all these things start to come up, yeah. and they come up all the time. I mean, they, they're. And they're very detailed and very, very powerful and very counterintuitive. But very quickly, particularly if you do research with your family, you'll discover these things are true. The problem with calling it psychic from my perspective is that there's still a separation of mind body. That there's an idea that there's an ephemeral field out there, you know, Rupert Sheldrake, make, you know, morphogenics, however you want to talk about it. But I've come to see that it's really about quantum mechanics which is really what they know now about what's beneath molecular, what creates molecular is energy. So that what's really happening is the human organism functions a little bit like a radio or, you know, uh, it's sort of like a radio. So it sends out signals, but it can also pick up signals. Yeah. And those signals, which can be infantile, can be even uh, pre-birth, prenatal can be picked up by an adult organism, sensed, and translated into adult language. Things that were pre-verbal can now be picked up by people who've been trained in this. It doesn't take a lot of training because it's all there. For instance, when anyone walks into a party and are honest with a bunch of people, you feel crazy, almost always, scared. Hmm. I mean, I had thought... Once I became a director and once I was successful, I could walk into any party and not be anxious because I'd be a Hollywood director. It wasn't true. It turned out not to be true at all. I was just as nervous as I'd been all the way along because I'm picking up all these resonating, all this stuff coming from all over the place. I don't know what to do with it. Sometimes you can close it down and pretend you're okay, but underneath it all, you're picking up. Pretend, stuff. yes. Pretend, yeah. yeah. At, at, your, at your peril. At your peril. Agreed. Or you can do some drugs or you can do some alcohol, which is okay. I mean, look, you do whatever you have to do to make it through the day, but at least admit that this is what's going on. In any case, I have seen this happen because we exist on planet Earth in a universe that is essentially consisting of energy. And I think coming back to what makes us tick. And what is that energy at its core? It is something you might all love. Because when you get it, you, you thrive. When you don't get it, you shrivel and can even die. So, it's, so the whole psychic thing is fascinating, but I think it can be explained and will be explained as science goes further and further and deeper and deeper into this, which is why I think we're going to survive as a species. It's going to be tough. I hope we don't end up using nuclear weapons. I think we're going to survive. And that's why I really do this work, because I feel like I want to be like my, like my grandmother, Seashore Granny, and pass on to the generations down the line, even if I'm forgotten, um, uh, some truth. So I'm, I'm going to connect that with uh, the conversation we had with Dean Radin. Um, Dean Radin is a head scientist at IONS um, in California. And uh, he talks about how the evidence points to psychic abilities. So I, I'm going to I'm going to use this word. I, I think we've been misusing this word because I think this word describes the capability that we all have 
to sense the resonances that we don't see, but we feel. And uh, I, th I think that's what it is. <laughs> I, I, I believe that's what it is. Um, and that we, I, I believe that we all have that capacity because we all know how to feel and we all know how to love. And you can't see feel and you can't see love. Yeah. But they're truths, right? Yeah, they're, 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 they're everything. <laughs> I mean, it's when you come right down okay. to it, you can be the richest person in the world. If you aren't loved, you're miserable. You can be the poorest person in the world if you're loved. You know, there's an interesting um, example. I forget who said it. Um, but there's some studies done. Where they would kind of work through it. And I use the example of the Ukrainian war when, because um, any war can be used, but let's use the most current one, most terrifying, at the moment, terrifying. Mm -hmm. um, there are other wars going on which aren't white people, of course. Yeah. Or inclined towards this. Yeah. But uh, there was a factory they were being bombed. Two different mothers are dealing with their children. One mother is freaking out, totally bewildered. You could use the word nar narcissistic if you want to. I just feel that's somebody who doesn't know who they are and are trying to figure it out and are desperately lost because they have no center. And, you know, I don't want to, I don't, again, I don't want to judge them, but that's where they're at. Completely can't be there for the kids. Just completely hysterical. And the kids are just having to go numb and freeze, freeze and just hang in there. Another mother, totally there. Could be a father too, but mothers are even more, I think, intimate in a way. Mm -hmm. um, um, totally there for the child. T totally there for the children. Focused on them. Aware that they're terrified. Speaks to the terror. Is totally there for them, completely. A bomb hits, the mother who was wonderful is killed. The mother who was awful, awful or just lost was not. Which children turn out better? That is, uh, that's an interesting question. And, and I think there's been enough studies done as the children who had a mother who was there for them at some point. Yeah. And because they then have an identity. And that's why it's called the Identity Development Institute. Because they then could see themselves... They could feel what they were feeling because when they were scared, their mother's face showed this, the fear, showed it was a mirror for them of who they were. That's what a child needs. And the child who is terrified and sees a mother totally lost and not there doesn't know where they are. So they're not going to be able to navigate later on in life, either the physical world they're in very well or their emotional world. And they're going to be in real trouble. War is a terrible example because we've got to get rid of this. It's the most ridiculous strategy. Um, that's ever emerged in the human species, and it doesn't solve anything. But in any case, love and connection are all that matter. Bonding. Um, are you afraid of dying? Well, I, I've been through a couple of things recently that made me have to deal with sort of existential issues. I mean, I'm 73, and I've had a couple of things. I've lost a lot of friends. Um, I've been close to a lot of friends. I was with my mother when she died. Um, you know, what I would say increasingly is, am I afraid of dying? Not so much afraid of it anymore. When you get older, you know, you're much younger. Um, uh, it becomes a reality. And so you either address it or not. Every once, I mean, I'm afraid in the moment when I'm driving a car and someone else hits me and my whole system is terrified and I get out of the way. I think I'm increasingly curious about it. I think that's what's sort of happening. It's like, What's going to happen? And all the people I see who are pretending it's not going to happen aren't doing very well. Um, and I did have to face um, a cancer, two different cancer scares, both of which turned out to be not a problem. And partially they weren't a problem because I wasn't scared. And I went right and got it all tested and looked at it right away and dealt with it right away. And it's all fine. But it certainly was for a week or two over whatever some holiday weekend when the doctor didn't get back to me where I had to go, well, I may you going to call. I'm going to be dead in, in a week. And I felt okay about it. You know, it was a really good example. Do I want to live to be 100 or like 115, as my eight-year-old says? Yeah, I'd like to live for a long time. You know, somebody said, a friend of mine who's like a, a 78 or 79, I have a lot of friends, you know, that, that older than me. And she said, you know, growing old, you know, what is Betty Davis's line? Growing old is, is not for sissies, you know? Growing old is way better than the alternative. And someone said to me, a friend of mine said to me just yesterday, today ago, when I, a couple of days ago when I met, he said, what, you mean getting younger? I said, no, there's only one alternative. That means you're dead. So, so I want to live as long as I can, but it'll be whatever it'll be. Um, is, is maybe uh, your pursuit of 
your creative curiosities trying to answer your curiosities of death? Are they, are they related, do you think? Um, no, I, I mean, I'm doing a lot of work around my life. Um, why am I doing this? I think I'm finding um, that all the exploration and a lot of writing, a lot of writing and sort of putting it down and trying to get my whole history sort of laid out. First of all, it has to do with being an artist, I think. Um, you know, somebody said, you know, the great writers, not that I'm a great writer at all, but the great writers only write the same story over and over and over again, and that's their life story fictionalized. Hmm. And what did Alfred Hitchcock say? Alfred Hitchcock said, uh, a movie is true life with all the boring parts cut out. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> right. um, you got a lot of boring parts, that's for sure, in our lives. So, so yeah, so, so it's like, so I think I'm really fascinated by life. And, and I think what I'm seeing in my own life is, yeah, there's a pattern to it. Yeah, there's, 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 a, there's, there's, a, there's a, some kind of structure to it. Like there's a structure to the you know, molecular structure to the organism. And like, there's some kind of structure to the universe that's way beyond the Big Bang Theory. Because the Big Bang Theory doesn't, and Rupert Sheldrake is, great, Sheldrake is great about this. It's like, he said the same thing. I mean, what was there before the Big Bang, guys? Or he has this great thing he talks about, which is, you know, the speed of light is 182,000 miles per second. Uh, no, it isn't. Because they measured it all over the Earth. And it came in at different speeds all over the place. So they decided, we'll say it's 182,000 miles Average it out. Say it's 182,000 miles per second. And it's not. It's like, so what does that mean? So it's just this sort of agreement to go, we're certain, as opposed to, we don't know. You know, it's sort of getting rid of the male thing. I mean, not that, not that women are particularly into uncertainty, but they kind of caught a little bit more in it than men are. Because having a child, childbirth, all these complicated things. They're the things, riskier life that way. Uh, yeah, it's a riskier life. And also, it's saying, <laughs> you know, if you've had children, and I totally understand not having kids, I can totally get people saying, it's not what I want to do. Yeah, sure. I chose to do it. And the great thing about it is you aren't humbled by being a parent. You are humiliated. You try going up against a three-year-old and punish them. <laughs> it, 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 you better not, because they will push the nuclear, talk about nuclear button, they'll push the nuclear button, and you will be you know, you, if you don't do this, you're going to have to stay home for a week. Or you know, if you don't do this, you're not going to have dessert for a week. And you go, oh, shit. Is that what I have to do now? I'm going to have to put up with a week of them carrying on about not having dessert, you know, or you're not going to be able to, and you go, don't go to that place because they will take you apart. So as a parent, you're wonderfully humiliated. I think the exploration of creativity is... It can be in uh, the metaphor could be embodied in in that thir in that three year old like the the relentless three year old who wants what they want wants to explore what they want could be the creative self like that creative self it can not not be it needs to it needs to move it needs to flow yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Like the spirit and, of a three year old and and it's interesting because they need boundaries. And you, mm. you know, you know, when they're little, when they're really little, you need how can I say a fence so they don't go put their finger in a socket. <laughs> but what I think happens is the boundaries have to get much larger than we thought they were. You know, we also have to stay sane as parents because it's really difficult. You know, sometimes you know you need to go to bed at eight o'clock because if you don't go to bed at eight o'clock, I am going to lose my 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 brain. I'm going to have nothing left of me. You've got to go to sleep. It's why do I have to go to sleep? Well, because it's time you got to be up in the morning. No, no, it's because I will lose my mind if you don't get into bed now. You know, yeah. <laughs> it, it, but it's so. It's, but it's. I think if there was a way of describing the good parts of what I did as a parent, it was something I learned from my drunk parents, which mm -hmm. was to not be all that disciplined, to let them have the space to find themselves. And I think also with with both of them, for me, my love of art. My my absolute and why don't I love art? I mean, I grew up in this weird cult, really weird, very Christian, very conservative. But they had stained glass windows, beautiful stained glass windows in this beautiful Gothic cathedral that they built. And the beauty of those stained glass windows, I'm very clear, was my first iteration towards cinema. 
And, and the pleasure it gave me to look at that glass as a kid, not understanding the stories in the glass, not understanding I'm supposed to learn to be disciplined or, or worship a God on my knees or whatever. No, it was the colors, the artisans, that the art that went into that was so deeply pleasing um, that that's why I loved art. And I remember, I remember having a conversation. I got into Proust at one point. I started, I started going to the gym and doing audio tapes on, um, uh, and I started because I wanted to listen to all the books I'd never read. And I totally got into Proust. He's just the awesomest, you know, and I had heard about Proust. It was very intimidating. I was at a cocktail party at one point. So well, I'm listening to Proust in the audio track. And this woman went at me, you cannot listen to Proust while you're in the gym. You have to read Proust in a book. I went, well, I'm listening to him. And I'm loving him. He's just a soap opera guy and, you know, the turn of the 20th century. And he's like, he's totally cool. And he's messed up. And she was like so angry at me. Oh, one other quick story. And then I'm going to stop. And let yeah. you take, so just I, like, I had one last question anyway, so we're good. We're okay, good. okay. So, so, the other, so when, um, when Maggie was going to looking at colleges, I won't name the college. We went to a college and there was a, a professor there. And she took us around and she started telling the story. I missed the first part of it. But how a poet flew in. And she met him at JFK. It was before it was JFK, I think, yeah. Um, and he was drunk out of his mind. And she picked him up and she put him in the car. He started driving back to the school where he was going to give a lecture that night. And he was so drunk and she was so pissed off. She turned around, she drove back, and she said, you go back to her from where you can. Hmm. And it was Dylan Thomas. Wow. <laughs> and wow. I'm going, why do you want to tell that story? That's the most idiotic thing I've ever heard done in my life. And I love poetry. And I've published a book of poetry. I think, we, yeah, we talk about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm going, Dylan Thomas, I don't care if he's on acid. I want him next to me to yeah. hear whatever it was. He was, you know, he was a mess. He was crazy. He was crazy. And no one wrote more about beauty and grace and nature and love and the complexity of being a human being than well, I mean, a lot of people did, but Dylan Thomas is right up there as far as I'm concerned. It's a story on judging when you also live in uncertainty. Yes, that's right. That's right. That's right. We you don't judge. <laughs> uh, last question. What, yes. what does greatness mean to you? Uh, <laughs> so I went through a really rough time. Um, I was worth a lot of money had a house in Martha's Vineyard and a house on top of Mulholland, an acre of land with ponderosa pines and Oscar parties and blah, 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 and, um, and way overextended myself and went bankrupt. Um, and basically took a while for it. To, it got, got worse and worse and worse. Turned out, you know, you don't have a house in Martha's Vineyard with the Clintons and the Kennedys, and you're not making a lot of money, and you have to have, you know, Lots of cars and a, someone who cleans up the, the winter time, all this stuff. So suddenly I was hugely in debt. And I and it was also moving through a divorce. It was bad, bad time. And I said, I have to move out of this house with an infinity pool, looked out over the whole city. I got to move into an apartment that's $1,000 a month. And a bunch of people said, no, you can't. There's no, there's no LA. You can't get an apartment. I found one. I moved into it. And I became really drawn to... Um, Skid Row. I had been always involved in intrigued with Skid Row um, because my father had spent time there and somewhat romanticized all of that. And he actually hitchhiked. He, he took the train, the, the trains. He went with the hobos at one point across to California with his buddy, read somebody, I don't remember. So I was always drawn in some ways to that world. Anyway, I decided I was going to do a show about it. And I won't go into the show, but I was sort of developing it. So I ended up going to Skid Row in L.A., when living with terribly in debt still. Um, now I was in debt, but I'm a white guy who can direct television. So how poor was I? I mean, yeah, I was in debt, but not so bad. Sorry, folks. Don't cry for any of that. And I was developing the show. So I went down to Skid Row and I began to talk with everyone down there, not to give them anything, but to get something from them. I wanted to know their stories. I wanted to know the stories. Makes me cry even now. There was a guy. 
who um, was homeless, who had been left at the at the steps of a fire station when he was an infant, newborn, and they sent him to an orphanage. And he grew up, and he was, I think, in the war. I can't quite remember because a lot of the a lot of the people in Skid Row are veterans who've really seen combat, like my father saw. It. You know, when you hear someone talk about combat, they usually weren't there. The ones who, who were in combat never want to talk about it. All right. So about 40% of the homeless are, are veterans that have not been taken care of at all. And, of course, I had an affection for that just because of my dad, really. Um, anyway, this guy had been written up in the papers at one point because what he did when he ended up in Skid Row was he went around every morning. He would get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and go around and look in every corner and under cardboard and whatever to find abandoned babies because a lot of women brought their babies to Skin Row and left them there. And he saved 19 babies. Holy smokes. And that's greatness. And one day in the middle of all this, he had no place to stay. And I said, you can stay. I was down there, you know, no money, but I could afford a room, you know, so, I, so I'm not poor. But um, it's romantic, my story. Oh, there's millions of dollars in debt. And someone once said, the only people who are millions of dollars in debt are white people. You know, <laughs> you don't get that way. So anyway, and I cleared all that up in the end. So I had this room, and I gave him the room to stay in one night. And I came to see him, and he had left his sneakers outside. He'd gone in without his sneakers on. And they smelled like dead people. And he was so ashamed to go into the room with those shoes. And that's greatness to me. I have nothing to say. Uh, Stephen, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for all this. <laughs> for, for all this insight and this education. Uh, it's lots of learning. Thank you. Thank a pleasure. You. Totally a pleasure. Totally a pleasure. <laughs> hey, it's Enrico Colantoni here, actor, director, and dedicated napper. Like what you heard today? There's more to come. Make sure to subscribe to Behind Greatness and learn about our live events at inspirenorth.com. You'll also find links to our social media right on our website, so be sure to give us a like and follow. Until next time, stay inspired. <laughs>